I'm going to try to be as gentle as possible on this here. There, there's a lot of really, really good, loving Christian people who really sincerely do love the Lord. They've, they've never heard of these things. They've never studied the historical origins of these traditions. Um, I, I don't want to come down too hard on anybody, but, but now considering the unprecedented falling away from the church and atheism, it is vitally important that we check ourselves. We, we have to come to grips with the reality of this issue. Con continuing to associate our Messiah with these ancient heathen practices and, and some of these ridiculous fairy tales is only really accelerating this falling away from the church, especially with the youth. This new generation is, is not investing its heart and soul in what it perceives to be an obsolete fiction that demands our attention. You know, the, the Christian church today doesn't have the monopoly on our attention that it used to have maybe more than 50 years ago. The church today is competing with a entertainment-saturated type society where these old fairy tales are not going to really cut it anymore. They're going to have to come to grips with and embrace the reality of who Jesus really was, rather than insisting that the lies we inherited from our fathers are somehow true. It, it is an irrefutable historical fact that Christmas, its, its date of December 25th, the decorated tree, the majority of its traditions, are a continuation of Nimrod's Babylonian winter solstice sun worship festivals that, that were later modified to engulf and absorb Christianity into itself. You know, however well-meaning quoting the soundbite that Jesus is the reason for the season may be, that soundbite really has become atheist rocket fuel. And also, if you if you just consider the facts and the reality, it is that that soundbite is also bearing a gross false witness against the true Son of God, in luring him to the same level as the sick, twisted heathen sun gods which his people continuously battled with throughout the entire scriptures. I, I mean, any kid with the ability to read can quickly pick up an encyclopedia or a world religion textbook and quickly learn that the focal point of the entire Christian year has been st stolen directly from ancient paganism. I mean, millions of young people who learn these historical facts, th they quickly assimilate Jesus with all the other sun gods, thanks in part to the unwitting insistence of the various denominations that Jesus is the reason for the season. Children of this generation aren't settling with fairy tales anymore. They're discarding them. D due to our repeated stubbornness in our adulteration with this Babylonian paganism over the centuries, Jesus is now perceived by a majority of Christians to be a fairy tale. I mean, if you study the polls asking Christians, even pastors, what they really believe, it, you'll see what I'm talking about. Christianity has become a cultural feather in the hat. I, you know, like a dash of color or a family heirloom. God to most Christians is no longer a reality, as proven by our disobedience to God's most fundamental requirement that we do not commit adultery against him with other gods. The bride of Christ needs to be faithful to her husband. Many people ask, why would we tie the birth of our Messiah to the birth of the ancient Babylonian anti-Messiah and then unwittingly follow in the shadows of his ancient child sacrifice rituals in the, in the entire catastrophe? So we need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? Well, we should no longer leave it up to our wild imagination to decide for ourselves what Jesus would do. We, we need to consider the scriptures and see what did Jesus do. We don't want to rationalize and conjure up excuses anymore. We, we want to walk in truth. 
So let's ask ourselves the question, what did Jesus do? Did Jesus ever celebrate Christmas himself? No, he, he was a Jew. He kept the feast instructed by his father. If you read through the Gospels, you'll see how Jesus actually expounded on the feast. Many of his greatest sermons were done at his father's feasts. The only thing Jesus celebrated in December was Hanukkah. When choosing how to live as Christians, we should follow his example. Jesus celebrated, taught, and lived his father's feasts. So let's ask ourselves another one. Would Jesus ever celebrate Nimrod's birthday of December 25th by symbolically re-erecting the symbol of Nimrod's cut-off penis in the form of a fir tree? Obviously not. But the reality is most Christians today do. A, a lot of people have, have the reply, you know, but, but that's not what Christmas means to me. It doesn't matter where these things come from as long as we do it for the Lord. But unfortunately, that excuse has been tried before. Remember the, remember the golden calf below Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 32? Aaron gathered up all the gold and, and the earrings and the, and the rings and all the jewelry, and he fashioned together this golden calf, and then he made the specific pro proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. How did God respond to this pagan holiday done in his name? He was furious. He wanted to wipe out the entire camp. But he, God ended up having mercy on the camp. And it only ended up costing the lives of uh, 3,000 men. And, and don't forget that this generation didn't get to enter into the promised land. No, Jesus warned us that we error and that we do not know the scriptures. Let's consider another scriptural example of this. Um, remember when King Saul lost the kingdom? For attempting to offer up to the Lord only the very best of what he had recovered after conquering the Amalekites, after being clearly instructed to destroy every last vestige of paganism from the land. God doesn't appreciate these kinds of offerings. It has been written over and over and over and over again. How many times will it take for us to remember it? Some people, um, when you talk about these things, they'll, they'll have another excuse that you'll hear is, but I have little children. Okay, now we have to, we have to sit and, and think this one through. So we would knowingly teach our children to celebrate the birthday of the Babylonian sun god by observing Nimrod's phallic evergreen re-erection ceremonies and then put them through the watered-down shadow pictures of ancient child sacrifices, all in the name of our Lord. And that's not it. I mean, then we're going to completely ignore all the feasts that God put into place, all the holidays that teach us about his love, because we don't want to look Jewish. Others even say, you know, well, I don't want to cause a ruckus with my parents, you know. Well, let's listen to what Jesus says. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I mean, are we going to follow the world or are we going to follow God? The scriptural metaphor for this is the broad and the narrow path. I mean, are we going to follow the, the majority of the world and just go down the broad path, the easy path? Don't make a ruckus. Just follow along what everyone else does. We're going to have lots of company, but the path leads to destruction. Or are we going to turn aside and follow the shepherd up the narrow path not very many people coming with you, but you're following the shepherd. And that path leads to everlasting life. So now that we know these things, we have to make the choice of who we love more. God and his word, or his enemy, Babylon the Great. The one in whom we obey is the one in whom we really love. You know, the, the hard part about delivering this particular message is that after you deliver these facts and people do the research and they find out their history and they ask their pastors if these things are really so and they come to the same conclusions, they know the reality, but they just can't make it past 
that blinking pine tree they love so much, and then they turn their back on God. Unfortunately, this is a message that today has to be delivered. There's just too many young people falling away from the faith because they think that their Messiah is a sun god. When he is not a sun god, he is completely and beautifully unique from all the Babylonian anti-Messiahs. We don't want to bear false witness against our God anymore. We don't want to commit adultery against our Father anymore. And I am confident that if people just find out who the Messiah really was, rather than cleaving to the lies handed down to us by our forefathers, they're going to find out that that God is much more beautiful. Messiah warned us that following him is not going to make us popular. A lot of people have the misconception that if you really, if you really love Jesus and you follow him, that life is just going to be a wonderful experience. But he actually warned us of the contrary. But he gives some encouragement as well. He said, Stand up for me against world opinion, and I will stand up for you before my Father in Heaven. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we are in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life that Jesus lived.